All you have to do is give them a turn of a phrase, or uh, one time I taught an agent to use the phrase, uh, uh, curable functional obsolescence, and it saved a deal. Thanks for joining us today. We have John Hooks with Hooks & Associates in the studio with us. Thanks for joining us, John. Thanks for having me, James. So I understand that um, the market dynamics are pretty fluid. What do you see in the market right now? I was listening to the radio on the way over, and the uh, National Association, the California Association of Realtors, said the median price of uh, California has now hit 800000 and up 20% in a year. So it's uh, challenging for everybody, and especially on the buyer side. That's crazy. I can't believe that uh, we've seen price appreciations. What percentage, you know, we're dealing with this a little bit, that we're seeing properties appraised under the purchase price. What percentage are coming in under purchase price? Uh, less than 8%. Uh, so 92% of all properties are supported that are selling. Uh, the 8% are if they get in a bidding situation and there's no closed precedent or closed sale to support that individual price then uh, that's the one that causes all the difficulties and the difficult for both appraisers and realtors. So we've had some conversations in some of our, our meetings that appraisers are asking the agents how many offers were on the property, mm -hmm. if there were multiple offers. Um, how much do appraisers weigh the fact that there's multiple offers on properties and are you asking what those uh, multiple offers were coming in at? Uh, I don't get all of them, but if there are multiple offers, I report that. The lenders will not lend upon that, and they don't give any credence to it. And there is a, uh, I just finished our uh, national law course uh, Saturday evening, and it specifically states in there you can't give any uh, consideration to a pending sale. I put them in every report, but the highest closed sale will cap the market. Interesting. And we, we are seeing some appraisals. You know, when you bring an appraisal in over the value, it kind of upsets the seller a little bit. The buyer's, of course, thrilled to death. What percentage of properties and, and why would you bring a property when you see the contract, you know what the sale price is, but yet we do see some appraisals come in over that sale price? That's not frequent because the appraiser doesn't establish market. He reflects the market and his report on the market. Uh, most of the times the seller won't know about it because they have no rights to the appraisal. The appraisal will only go to the buyer and the buyer's side of the report. So the sellers sometimes don't know about it, which may be in your scenario a good, good situation. Uh, so it, we don't usually try, uh, unless it's just clearly that it's been undersold, it usually is not the case. The market's pretty efficient. Uh, with, with technology, it's a very efficient market. So. Uh, it doesn't happen that often, and we're not establishing the market. If it's sold for a million dollars and I'm going to bring it in for a million one, am I better than the market? No. My job is to reflect the market. So talk about appraisals that come in under market. You know, there is a process to petition mm -hmm. or to try and overturn that appraisal and bring it up. We see from, you know, you know we did 4,000 transactions last year. We don't see that overturn very often. No, it's, what's, it's what's less than 2%. So what's the process, and is it even worth trying? It's worth trying, but I'm just, it, this is a national statistic, that it uh, is a less than 2% chance it'll be overturned. Number one, uh, some appraisers are insecure that their work, we're all capable of missing something. Uh, a week ago, uh, somebody found a comp that I had missed, and I revised my appraisal. Uh, I'm not making myself a... Uh, paragon of that example, but it, it can happen. So it's a good it's a good effort on everybody's part. They say, hey, did you use this comp? And I didn't, and I didn't see it, and I don't know why. And it, and it was an important comp. So some agents, they'll pull that lender and go with another lender to try and get another appraiser. Is there a database or something that um, you could switch appraisers? I know the lenders are going to still weigh that first appraisal that came in under value. But if you go to a different lender, or is that new appraiser privy to any information? Is there a national database or anything like that? None whatsoever. And uh, they're not privy to that. Uh, appraisers are chosen on a random basis. So let's say you had a, a possibility of 10 appraisers that worked for a lender. They were, there's hundreds. but So if, uh, if they didn't like that appraisal and they went to another one, then whoever is next uh, is geographically competent and is next on that rotation. And it keeps going like this. So 
You don't, you can't uh, choose Bill or Tom or John or Barry or anybody else. It's on a rotational basis. You can't request it. That hasn't gone that way since 2008. Okay, good to know. So we talked a little bit about the changes coming, mm -hmm. and um, there's a change in the way properties are measured, and it could affect, and we had a conversation before we started this, and um, you're saying that the uh, assessed value that's on the tax rec record, that the, the uh, appraised um, square footage, um, I'm sorry, the assessed square footage for the tax roll is not always accurate. Um, it's 40% of the uh, assessor's records are inaccurate. Uh, the assessor's records are for mass valuation tax purposes only. So I've taken 14 hours of classes. I'm going to take another four hours on February 9th on this. But uh, it's, it's only for mass valuation tax purposes. So it's not accurate on above grade square footage. It's not accurate on outbuildings. And it's not accurate on uh, basement areas. So it's, um, as I was talking to you, before uh, this began, uh, I did one on Monday. Uh, the people paid cash at $3.8 million for a 3,400-foot house. So the, ta the tax roll said 3,400 3, feet. 3,471 feet, okay? Uh, I measured it twice. It was 2,300 feet. So that's about 1,000 square foot less. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's 1,171 square feet less, <laughs> and, uh, and it was... You know, they paid 3.8 cash. Then they brought me in afterwards for uh, trust purposes and gifting purposes. I said, what's the square footage? And uh, some, the assessor's records, and I've t taught at the assessor's office in Signal Hill before, um, they had included an outbuilding that uh, you can never include in square footage. If it's not contiguously accessible from the inside of one part of a building to the next, then it's not square footage. Anything that's 18 inches or below the uh, grade level of the house, which is a basement, uh, is considered a basement, and that's not square footage from a lender's point of view. So if they borrow money on it, the basement has value, but it's separate from the living area. But if you and I bought a house and we were 1,100 feet different and we had paid 3.8 million under the assumption that now it's 33% smaller, uh, that's why you have to be very careful. That on, could on cause some it. significant problems. Yes. Um, wow. So let's hope, hope that's not going to happen. What, um, so what pitfalls could really affect our transactions? Uh, to compliment your organization, most uh, REMAX agents are extraordinary. It's a privilege when I get to work with them. And I know I'm saying that in front of the captured audience here, but I'm just telling you, I get calls from your agents constantly. I get called, you reference Bill. I got James Hager, John Briscoe just called me. Igor calls me all the time. Dan Christian calls me all the time. If anybody calls me, I'm going to give you my office number. It's 310-791-1444. You're free to call at any time. I return every call. I'll help you always. You always want to look like the smartest agent in the room. So at all times, I do that. All these people call me, some of your best agents, and say, hey, how are we going to look at this? Or uh, we have a situation uh, here, and uh, how, do, how does a lender look at this value? And I, all you have to do is give them a turn of a phrase or uh, a one time I taught an agent to use the phrase uh, uh, curable functional obsolescence, and it saved a deal, okay? And so you just have to give them the phrase when they meet an appraiser out there, and they'll, they'll sound like they know what they're talking about. So talk about the process of meeting appraisers. You know, we were told a couple years uh, after the financial crisis that the agents cannot talk to the appraisers, and, uh, you know, you're in violation, and the appraisers would be like, don't even come to the property. Has that changed, or was that ever a factor? Oh, yeah, that was a factor. But that happened uh, after the Dodd-Frank bill uh, in 2008, when they no longer, when uh, they would send it to an appraisal office, and I could uh, give it to my long-term staff of Doug or Tom, and they'd worked for me for 22 years, and that ended. So that fractured our industry and put us all separate, because unlike a brokerage where you could share the work among other realtors, it can no longer be done as an appraising. So if I'm a listing agent and I know there's an appraiser, I want to be at the property, I want to be, I want to bring an extra cup of coffee for you, and I want to have the comps. What other information would you like as an appraiser for me to bring when I meet you at the property? If you're really a, an elite agent, you've contacted, the appraiser's contacted you, but you've shared the comps with them before they come out. Um, and, and you don't ever want an agent meeting at the property. I don't. 
and I'm, I'm prepared anyway, but if they came to me and said, I'm going to email you the comps, well, I wasted my time because then I have to come back and I've lo I'm losing two to three days, whereas I like to turn it around within 24 hours. So I have the comps typed in the report with almost every contingency, and I've tripled the number of comps that are needed. That, that's the appropriate technique. An agent can use their experience, and if they could help, if there's a guest quarters, and make sure you provide a comp with a guest quarters. You're, you're expediting everything. You're, you're exponentially influencing that report more than anybody wants to admit. Okay? So how far away can you go from the subject property, and how long back can you go? Well, there's a myth about six months, okay? It, uh, mar the market will uh, accept a year right now, but let's say you had to have, have a tennis court comp, or you had to have a, a, a permitted uh, comparable with a, a guest unit. Uh, Fannie Mae guidelines, and most appraisers are not aware of this, you can go back up to three years to find wow. that, and then you bring that comp forward to today's value by just a statistical change and say, so what's the market done at that time? So at least you provide an example with a comparable with a guest house or something unique, if it had an ADU or if it had a uh, tennis court. Okay, so you always want to be the smartest agent in the room and it really works. And it helps, and it helps you. It helps everybody. Uh, there's an acronym called ANSI, American National Standards Institute. They're going to change the way all condominiums and single family homes are measured for the first time uh, ever, really. It used to be called a Fannie Mae standard and that went away in 2008. There's a trademarked methodology of more detailed measurement that's going to measure things to the inch, not just the nearest half foot. Wow. Uh, or you could go to the tenth of a foot would be 1.2 inches. So uh, garages are measured differently. from the You measure from the inside. Homes are measured slightly differently. It'll affect the way townhomes are measured in a positive way in terms of it won't necessarily deduct for multiple stairwells where formerly uh, bankers wanted you to do that. So if somebody knows how to do this technique and they have to go take classes and it all has to be in place by April 1st. So there's a scramble, scramble for this. Luckily, I got lucky and I saw this coming. About this thing, remember, uh, American National Standard Institute, the, uh, the slang name is ANSI, A-N-S-I. And it's nothing to worry about, it's nothing to be afraid of, but if you want to look like the smartest agent, April 1st is the criteria. All single families and condos will be measured to that standard if it's for a sale or a loan or anything like that. Well, John, you're a true professional. Thank you for joining us today. It's John Hooks and Associates, and feel free to give him a call. Thanks again. Okay.